We are in Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. We are looking at verses 37 to 41 tonight. Lamentations 3, 37 to 41. <clears throat> Who is he that saith, and it comes to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not good and evil? Wherefore does a living man complain, a man, for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. Father, we thank you for your word and strengthen us with this word, Lord. Forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Uh, give us understanding, we pray, and give us grace to walk after the things we know. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. In verse 37 to 41, I'm going to, I'm going to take a point from each one of these verses. The first one, who is he that saith, or we could say, who is he that decrees? And it comes to pass when the Lord didn't decree it. So the first is, whatever happens, God did it. God did it. Whatever happens, and remember we're in the midst of Jerusalem being uh, destroyed in the midst of Jeremiah looking at the sorrows all about him. So he, he is arguing here uh, that God did this, that God did this, because God does all things. And uh, Matthew Henry wrote in his, he said, he called this the duties of an afflicted state the duties of an afflicted state prescribed to us. Here's our duties under an afflicted state. So number one, to know whatever happens, God is the one who has done these things. We'll be looking at that a lot with the sovereignty of God in the upcoming conference. Thank you, Paul. Verse 38, out of the mouth of the Most High, once again, this idea of God's decree, out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. So God may send good or evil, that is, good or calamity, as he sees fit. Evil in the sense of some things are, appear good in a general sense and some appear evil in a general sense. Difficult, hard, calamitous. So the second thing is that God may send good or evil as he sees fit. Good or calamity as he sees fit. And he does. The third, and verse 39, so why does a living man complain a man for the punishment of his sins? When calamity comes, when God does decree calamity or an afflicted state, <clears throat> we have sins enough to be punished. As rational beings, we should be able to work it out that whatever has come to us is less than what we actually deserve since before God in a fallen state, we deserve his eternal uh, condemnation. And then 40, chapter, verse 40, number four, let us search and try or examine our ways and turn again to the Lord. <clears throat> Therefore, our duty is to search out and examine very closely our ways and return to the Lord. And then lastly, in verse 41, number five, let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We are to give ourselves wholeheartedly to this, to heart religion. Ceremony is not enough. It wasn't enough for Israel and uh, brought them under a very uh, calamitous situation because they were all ceremony and no heart. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us now to understand these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. So first of all, verse 37, who is he that saith, and it comes to pass, when the Lord didn't command it? So who is the one who can decree something that come to pass when God hasn't decreed it? And of course, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. Um, no one, no one can do that at all. 
who can operate independently of God. Nobody can operate independently of God. Uh, we operate within the sphere of our God. God operates independently of anything else. He is free. We have a freedom too, but our freedom is inside the circle of God's freedom. And it is bounded by our own humanity and our own, at this point, our own depravity as well until God sets us free. And uh, so we have, we have lots of things that bound us, boundaries that we have. Who is he that saith, and it comes to pass when the Lord commands it not? Nobody operates independently of God. So whatever happens, we can be assured as Christians, God hath done it. God has done it. In the Geneva Bible notes, they write, he shows that nothing is done without the providence of God, without the rule of God. Everything's under the rule of God. And in the Family Bible notes, God's control over all human affairs is unlimited. There's no limitation there. And this is uh, where some, some do limit God's uh, rule in the earth. Some try to protect God by saying that he's not a part of hurricanes and tornadoes and bad things. Whatever bad things are, that's the devil. The good things are God. And they divide it out that way. Our text itself, as well as, as, well as other texts, is going to deny that because God is the author also of these calamities. He's still the first cause of all that comes to pass. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say, who is it that can effect by a word anything without the will of God? God's will of purpose. So we divide up the will of God into two kinds of wills. We call it the will of purpose and the will of command. His will of command is what he commands us in the scripture, uh, where he says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Uh, does that will, is that will ever thwarted? Do, do people go against that will? Certainly they do. It's God's will of command, what he has commanded men to do. But his will of purpose, his purposes uh, are always accomplished. Benson in his commentary said, the command, that commands, who is he that saith, who is he that commands an event to take place? and predicts it shall take place, and it comes to pass accordingly, if the Lord had not commanded it. Or who can design a thing and bring the designs to effect when the Lord is against him? Haughty tyrants may boast of their power as if they were equal to omnipotence itself, but still it is God's prerogative to bring to pass whatever he pleases. Do not calamities as well as prosperous events happen by God's will and pleasure. The sum is nothing comes to pass in the world but by the disposal of divine providence directed by infinite wisdom, justice, and goodness. The inspired writer seems to be arguing himself and the people of God into a quiet submission to the divine will in their afflictions from the consideration of the hand of God, that it's the hand of God. It's a great doctrine, it's a great truth that whatever happens, God is the first mover of all that comes to pass. It is a very soft pillow to lay our heads in the midst of calamitous times, that the universe is not out of control, that there's not an atom out of control, that God is in control of all things. Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, ordered by the Lord. And there are many devices in a man's heart, Proverbs 19. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord will stand. Men think to do many things. We think to do many things. We have many plans, and our plans get busted all the time. Our plans get changed all the time. So, Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So we're supposed to devise ways. We're supposed to plan for things. And yet, as Christians, we know the Lord is directing our steps. We just figure out how to be in step with the Lord. Proverbs 20, 24, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Well, it's a, it's a divine thing. It's a divine work. Who can will something into existence? In the Word of Faith movement, they will tell you that if you speak certain words, you can speak your own reality 
into existence. So hasn't worked out always. So if it did work out, you found out it was the will of God. Isaiah says to the wicked that were in faraway countries, gird yourselves, in other words, strengthen yourselves, you're going to be broken in pieces. Strengthen yourselves and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, it will come to nothing. Go ahead and speak the word, it will not stand. Do all you want, you can strengthen yourself, you can make your armies, do all you wish. I will thwart it. So number one, whatever happens, God did it. He's the first mover of all that comes to pass. Number two, in verse 38, out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. God may send good or calamity as he sees fit. Matthew Poole said in the Hebrew, the form of these words is interrogatory as much as if he should say, does not evil come out of God's mouth from his direction and command in his providence as well as good. He speaks of the evils of punishment and judicial afflictions and it is no reproach unto God to make him the author of his own punishments as we call them evil. Isaiah 45, seven, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace, I create evil or calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. And then the famous text in Amos 3, six, shall the trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord has not done it? Not possible. So the sending of good to the human race is called grace and mercy. The sending of evil or calamity to the human race, the fallen human race, is called justice and righteousness. So whatever happens, God did it. And God may send good or evil as he sees fit. And then thirdly, when calamity does come, we have sins enough to be punished. Why does a living man, he says, why does a living man complain a man for the punishment of his sins? And so Jeremiah, as he looks about him and he sees death and destruction everywhere, and it certainly has come to his mind that the evil of Israel, and we've, we've read it in numerous times in this poem where he talks about the sins of this nation and that they, people just keep sinning and they just keep figuring God will never do anything about it because God is long suffering. And so when Jeremiah sees the destruction all about him, why should men complain a man for the punishment of his sins? Benson writes, it's the due reward of our sins and designated as a chastisement in order to purify or to amend us for the trial of grace and in order to the exercise and increase of the grace of the saints. If we view our afflictions in this light, it will prevent the murmuring and repining against the providence of God. And it is easy for us to murmur and repine after the most simple setbacks, the most simple afflictions. The tiniest afflictions, our hearts rise up in murmurs. So. We need to learn to do better, don't we? That God may give us, God may give us greater ones to challenge us in the future. Benson writes, we shall learn to be patient and resigned under his chastening hand and even thankful, and even thankful that he condescends to correct and try us for our profit and by preserving us alive in the body, still gives us space for repentance. Uh, Tara was reading on our way here, one of Lou Priolio's little booklets, and he was talking about putting out and putting off, and he was talking about a glass of water, and that if you wanted to displace the water, you'd have to put something heavier in it, or maybe just fill it full of epoxy glue and harden it right off. And what he was saying was the putting in Putting off our sins is one thing. Putting on virtue is another thing to maintain it and that it's a necessary thing for us to put something on. What he says here, it's not just resigning ourselves to the trouble that we're in. 
that we have or the affliction. It's actually being thankful for it. That's the putting on. That's going beyond. That's the extra mile. I was reading in the, in the Sermon on the Mount again about going the extra mile with the soldiers and thinking about you know, how we have taken that term now and we, say, we tell people about, you need to go the extra mile. Usually they mean, you know, work harder in business and something else and something else like that. And yet the going the extra mile in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, was taking abuse from a foreign soldier who was making you carry his pack for a mile because they were allowed to make you do that. And going the extra mile was to be so in tune with God and rejoicing in God that you stayed with the soldier for two miles. Instead, you took his pack another mile just as a testimony to the fact that your God is God and that you're okay with his providences. So whatever happens, God does it. And God may send good or evil calamity as he sees fit and when calamity comes, we have sins enough to be punished. Fourthly, therefore, our duty is to search out and examine closely our ways and return to the Lord. It says, let us search and try. The word for try there is to examine something very closely. Let us search and examine very closely our ways and turn back to the Lord so that the Lord is always using calamity in your life. He's always using problems in your life, trouble in your life, irritations in your life. The old you know, example of the pearl having an ear, it comes out of an irritation that it works over and you end up with a pearl, that grain of sand. God's always putting those in your life constantly, why? To teach us to search and examine our, closely our ways. Why? Because we don't do that. We just dally along in, you know, halfway Christianity until God hits us again and we remember how weak we are because we don't respond properly to the things that he's sending us. And we rem remember we need him and we need to ask for his help and we need to show forth a better virtue and more of a Sermon on the Mount attitude and life before God. Our duty is to search out and examine closely our ways and then return to the Lord. As it says in Revelation, do the first works, do the first works. Go back to those days of your zeal as a new believer when you wanted to understand the word of God. Something else uh, Lou said in that little booklet on the way, he said some people read the Bible not to find out what the will of God is, but to vote on the will of God. <laughs> not to find out and do it, but find out and decide whether or not I want to do it. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Hosea chapter 14, go to Hosea chapter 14, great text. <clears throat> There's a number of them that you could go to, but Hosea chapter 14, a great text talking about repentance. <clears throat> Verse 1, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. That's how we fall. We, we fall when we sin. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. Take with you words. That's how you got to make things right with people too, isn't it? Yeah, the only way you make peace with people is by actually taking words with you and saying, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And it's the same way with God. We are to take words. We are to confess things. We are to say things to God. Take away our iniquity and receive us graciously and so we will render the calves of our lips, we will praise you again. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, and neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods. For in you, for in the true God, the fatherless find mercy. 
I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. My anger is turned away from him. I will be like the dew unto Israel. He will grow as the lily and cast forth roots like Lebanon. His branches will spread and his beauty shall be like an olive tree and smell like Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow will return and they will revive as the corn or the wheat and grow as the vine and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. He pours on the mercy. He shows how much he will restore and be gracious to. So it's our duty. It's our duty. Let us search and try our ways and then turn to the Lord again. This is a daily duty. This is a regular duty for us. Where is it, Lord, that I am not walking in obedience? And then lastly, in uh, verse 5, verse 5. We'll start back at 37. Who is he that saith, who decrees, and it comes to pass when the Lord doesn't decree it? Out of the mouth, out of the decree of the Most High, proceeds not evil and good. Why does a living man complain for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and examine our, our ways closely and turn again to the Lord. And let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. An interesting phrase. Lift up the heart. Let us lift up the heart with our hands. So they would at times lift their hands to heaven in the worship of God. We read about it in the Old Testament in numerous places. But it is a lifting up of the heart with the hands. In other words, that it's a genuine, it's a genuine worship that's going on. It's, it's a giving of ourselves to God wholeheartedly. Once again, have we given ourselves to God wholeheartedly? Are we giving ourselves regularly to God wholeheartedly from the heart? Lift up our hearts for what, to what end? To be examined by the Lord. In John chapter 3, that great text, for everyone who does evil, he hates the light. He doesn't come to the light because he doesn't want his deeds to be reproved. But the one who does truth, who is the Christian, he comes to the light so his deeds could be made manifest that they are wrought in God. So we lift our hearts up to God's piercing light because as Christians we want to know whether or not what we're doing is right or wrong. Lift up our hearts to be cleansed. Created me a clean heart, O God, David says, and renew a right spirit. Created me a clean heart. We lift up our heart because it needs to be examined by God in the light of God, and then it needs to be cleansed. And we lift up our heart to God in the sense of trusting in God too. David said in Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, in God. And I am helped, and therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. When we are enabled by God to trust him, it, it, it does cause rejoicing in our heart. When God enables us to be able to trust him and not murmur against the troubles that are brought into our lives. And then last of all, we lift up our hearts in praise to God. If they've been lifted up to be examined and then cleansed and then to trust and rejoice, then it will be their praise will be the end of that. Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song, I praise him. I will praise thee, O Lord, David says, with my whole heart. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart and glorify your name forever. So, Henry says we should not quarrel with God about our afflictions. That we are men and not brutes. We are reasonable creatures. We should act in reason. And know that the good hand of our God is upon us so long as we live upon this earth. And we should never complain about the just punishment of our sins. And that we are to set ourselves to answer God's intention when he afflicts us by bringing sin to our remembrance, by letting our conscience be employed to search out and try us with what he calls dealing faithfully with ourselves and an impartial trial 
And we are to judge of our state, not by our faint wishes, but by our actual steps. What are we actually doing? What have I done? What have I contributed to the public flames, Henry says, that we may each of us mend one, and then we should all be mended if we would mend ourselves. A sincere conversion to God. David said, I thought on my ways and I turned my feet into your testimonies. So some good lessons that God gives to us. God does all things evil and good. And when evil comes, we are not to murmur. We have enough sins to be punished. Our duty is to search out and examine closely our ways, return to the Lord, and then lift up the heart. Lift up the heart to God and, O oh God, examine me, show me, teach me, cleanse me, that I may rejoice again in you. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word and ask that you would indeed give us that true heart religion. Quiet our hearts. Calm us, Lord. Calm us before you. Take away our love of sinning, Lord. Take away our deceptions in our own hearts and minds. Take away our anger. Take away our malice. Take away our worries. Take away our lusts, our improper desires. Take away all things, Lord, that are a problem and that bring uh, the judgment of God upon us. We ask, O oh God, that you would indeed uh, make us uh, unto yourself, uh, an imitator of the true and living God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragements here in the text. And we do lift up our hearts tonight and ask that you would search them out and then help us, Lord. Help us, help us in our times uh, away from this place to have times with you, quiet times, uh, that our lives would not be filled with just people, but that our life would be first filled with God so that we can actually live among the people. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.